men are having a hard time being men. You, you, first off, you have all the addictions, right? The pornography, the gambling, you know, the alcohol, the cocaine, the food, all that, right? You, massive, massive. But then you also have all of the brokenness, um, the, the rise in suicides among men, depression, anxiety disorders, okay? But then you just have all that, you know, just kind of that army of great guys out there who feel like they're blowing it. You know, they, just, they don't feel good as dads. They don't feel like they know what to do with a marriage. They don't know how to handle a career. You know, and so you just, you just take all of this debris, right? I mean, what, what do you do with this evidence? How else do you explain that, right? Well, it all points back to one issue, right? It's, it's that deep, profound woundedness in the heart of men and how they mishandle it. Because men are famous, for mishandling our own brokenness, right? Well, I can tell you what the crisis is. I can tell you what the cause of that is, right? You need to heal the heart of men. And then you'll get a man who knows how to love a woman. Then you'll get a man who knows how to be a dad. I'm going to start with the story of David and Goliath, and we all know that story is. And what I found interesting, I never knew this before, um, I did a Google search for that. Before I found this video that you just watched, I thought, well, I'll just start with a, a, a video of David and Goliath. And I scrolled, and I scrolled, and I scrolled. And what I saw was animation, cartoons, things aimed at little kids. And I thought, my goodness, this is a, this is a warrior. This guy kills a lion and a bear, and he kills a giant, and all we have is animation? Almost, to me, almost as if to say, well, that's not real. That's just kind of an illustration. But at Radiant Church, we believe God's Word is real. It is actual. And when it says David killed a lion and a bear, he killed a lion and a bear, okay? So I'm going to start with that story, but I don't want to focus on Goliath. I want to focus on the lion and the bear because something happened in his life long before he got to Goliath that enabled him to not miss a beat, to just stand up and say, hey, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the living God? And he goes in, and he takes care of it. Something happened in his life way back in his youth with his father, Jesse, that enabled him to be prepared for that, and that's this. He was invited into manhood. And so that story of David um, and his father and the lion and the bear and Jesse is actually a great way to uh, start to think about our topic for today. So our series is Authentic Manhood. Our topic for today is Seasons of Manhood. So the seasons of manhood is what we're going to talk about. So before we move on, here's one question for the guys. Ladies, you can participate too. This, I mean, this is just answer this to yourself. Was there anything in that video that resonated with you? Just when he said something, maybe down here and you, you just went, oh. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's me. I, I see myself there. Maybe, maybe. Well, here's some questions for you. Go ahead and put that next slide up if you would. Uh, I'm sorry, the next one. All right, do you sense that something's missing? When I say something, let me define what something is. When I say that, I mean like down here in your innermost being as a father, maybe as a son, as an employee, as a husband, as a father, just as a man, do you, do you just have this abiding sense that, man, there's something missing. I'm just not quite getting it. But I'm doing my best to pull it off. I'm just going through the motions, right? I get up and I do everything that I do every day, every week, um, and I'm just going through the motions, and I'm desperately looking over my shoulder, maybe figuratively, maybe literally, hoping that nobody figures this out that nobody figures out, I don't really know what the heck I'm doing, or I'm really unsure, or that I, there are some things missing here that I never acquired. And I don't know what it is or why it is, but I hope nobody figures that out about me. Nobody catches on. You have an abiding sense maybe that you're not where you should be. Man, I feel like at this point in my life, either in your career, your family, maybe your age, I feel like I should be here instead of clear back here. Or I'm not what I should be. By now, I ought to be, you know, such and such. Do you have that abiding sense? And then as a result of all that, you just wish that there were a map. Man, I wish there were a map, a road guide or something to get me from, you know, boyhood or from where I am now to where I need to be. Well, there is a map. 
There's actually good news. And so the point for today is this. In fact, this is really uh, the message in an entire sentence. If you just want to write this one sentence down, this will be everything I'm going to say today. A man doesn't become a man just because he grows older. Man doesn't become a man just because he, he grows uh, older in age. I mean, we've all seen the uh, 55 or 60-year-old, 10-year-old. Maybe you have them in your family. You meet them every you know, holiday season or something. Okay, because manhood is a process. It's not something you just grow into. It's a process that you're invited into. Steve Budolph is a pastor. He says this. He says, for 95% of human history, boys weren't launched or catapulted into manhood. They were welcomed into it. You go all around the world, all cultures, and you see that in most cultures, uh, boys are invited into manhood. There's certain things that they go through, stages they go through, and that all requires the active, key word is active, active intervention of a father or other men if a father's not present for a variety of reasons, okay? In other words, masculinity is handed down. It's passed down from one person to another. Now, this next one um, might sting just a little bit, so I'll give you a warning. Go ahead and put that up. No woman on earth wants to be a parent to a child and to a husband. There are far too many men who live this way and apparently didn't jump through the necessary hurdles of maturation only to graduate into manhood with a male body but a fetal mind. A male body, but a fetal mind. And the fact is, we live in a world, an entire world, entire culture of men, um, many of whom were never invited into manhood, never initiated, never welcomed, never uh, had that handed to them. Okay, you look around, what you see oftentimes, you see boys, but you see boys driving significant vehicles. You see boys holding down careers. You see boys with families. You see boys uh, running companies. But they don't have any inner strength. They lack resolve. They lack uh, maturity, emotional maturity, wisdom that allows them to really live as men uh, in this fallen world. Well, in contrast to all that, that's all kind of a downer, bad news, but in contrast to all that, here's really good news, okay, is that God does provide us a map. He does provide us a path by which we grow from boyhood or where you are now, wherever you are, into manhood. And there's stages by which boys become men. And if you didn't get that as a boy, if you didn't get it as a teen, you didn't acquire it as a young man, it's not too late. You can still get it. My own story is, is just that. Uh, my dad was born uh, in the early years of the Depression and uh, with no father, never had a father in his life. And as a young boy, especially in that Depression era, he learned how to do what you do. You work. So you just work. You work multiple jobs. You work side jobs. Always work. And when it came time and he had a family, had myself and my siblings, he provided for us very well because he didn't want us to you know, live the way he lived. So he did that. Never an abuser, never a womanizer, never used chemicals, uh, none of that. Nothing, nothing like that at all. Just work. The result is he's never home, and so what I needed, I'm the only boy in our family, what I needed, I didn't get from him. I did get some things, but I didn't get what I needed to be welcomed into manhood because he never got it. You can only give what you received. He didn't receive it. He couldn't pass it on to me. Okay, I can remember, my dad died in my early 20s, and I can remember um, not one single, not one conversation of any consequence other than factual. I'm going here, or we're going to do that, or let's, whatever. Nothing um, that would be uh, on what we're talking about, inviting into manhood. But the good news is, uh, when I surrendered to Christ in my mid-30s, God started to bring those men to me, and I did receive it. So if you didn't receive it or you got stuck somewhere, it's not too late. You can still get it. God brought the right people to me who started to show me the things that I needed to see. And we'll look at some of those things along the way here this morning. But that's the hope at Christian, of Christianity. If you didn't get it, it's not too late, okay? God does it. God says of himself in the Bible, I'll be a father to you, and you'll be my sons. Now, that's not some weird mystical thing where he'll just, you know, Casper the ghost into your heart and suddenly you'll become a man. 
No, he'll do the fathering, but he's going to do it through flesh and blood. He's going to bring people into your life who will be fathers to you. And if you'll surrender to that process, it'll be good, okay? Well, these stages by which boys become men uh, build upon one another, okay? They have to stack upon one another, and they're presented chronologically today, but it's important to know, again, that you don't become a man just because you pass through the ages. Uh, there are always exceptions, because when this doesn't happen, chronologically, when it doesn't happen, then again, you see the 55-year-old, 10-year-old. On the flip side, we know a guy who, when he was, and he's much older now, when he was 29 years old, he pastored a good-sized church. And if you didn't know him, you just heard him speak, you'd think this guy was 60 or 70 years old. When he spoke, there was just, there was authority, man. There was weight to what he had to say because he humbled himself and he surrounded himself with the right people. And we know today some young men who are wise beyond their years, maybe in their 20s or early 30s, and they have wisdom way beyond their years. And so, again, it's not necessarily uh, relegated to just your age, although that's, that's part of it, okay? So different people break these stages of manhood down differently, different authors, different thinkers. You, you see different kinds of them. I read a lot of them. Um, but they're all kind of the same. They all kind of say the same thing. They might use different terminology. They basically say the same thing, and they all end up in the same place. So what I'm going to use for you today is from John Eldridge, uh, who's been uh, influential in my own walk with the Lord. And so here we go. Let's jump in. Stage one is this. It begins at birth and runs through about age 12. It's a time of boyhood. Uh, age 12 is sixth grade, I guess, seventh grade. It's a time of discovering. It's a time of receiving your father's strength, as in transference, receiving your dad's strength. A cat time when a boy knows that he's loved. Think about Joseph and his coat of many colors. Joseph knows that he's special. He knows he's wanted. He's got this coat. He's got this special thing his dad handed to him to demonstrate that. He knows that his dad wants him. And this gives context to everything else because here's what can happen. Life is going to hand this boy some trials, some temptations, some setbacks. And if he doesn't have this as a foundation, he's going to start to feel like, I've been abandoned. Where's God? Now I'm in this situation the, the circumstances come into my life. I don't have a clue what to do, and I've got nobody to tell me. I have no connection with my father, so he can't tell me. Or maybe I do have a connection, but he never grew beyond boyhood. He can't tell me. And then he might start thinking, God, where are you? Why did you abandon me? The next step after that is you draw faulty conclusions. There must be something wrong with me. I'm in this circumstance. I can't figure it out. I feel abandoned. I know why it is, because... Something's wrong with me. I'm just deficient in some way, shape, or form, okay? And that is where this whole thing uh, progresses to. At a minimum, maybe he just experiences just hassles, and he sees everything as a hassle. And life is some hassles, but those hassles have a purpose usually, and that's to propel us forward, okay? And so um, all this can happen when a dad's passive, not engaged, Passive for a variety of reasons. It can happen when dad is violent. When dad is violent toward his boys, toward his boy. Uh, vomiting anger, rage upon them, violence, violent actions, violent activities. And a boy figures out pretty quick, man, I'm not safe here. I may not even be wanted. I think I'll just keep my distance. And then you've got this, you know, distance between you. So knowing that you're loved, knowing that you're valued, knowing that you're wanted, knowing that you're enjoyed by another man is essential and it's foundational. Well, let's go to the next phase. It uh, starts at about 13 through 19. Eldridge calls it the cowboy phase. This is a time of testing and adventure, uh, getting out and trying some different things, discovering your abilities. And the key question for a boy at this age is, you know, am I capable? Do I have what it takes? Am I becoming a man? Am I, on, am I on the way? How am I doing here? Just kind of in his own mind, wondering, how am I doing here? I think about David, who was tested as a shepherd, as a young boy, as a shepherd. Then he went and killed Goliath. There's an order to those things. See, those answers, am I a man? Do I have what it takes? Those only come through other men. Your mom can give that to you, and that's good. You need that. You need it from another man. You need that stamp of approval. 
I like to refer to that as a tattoo on the brain. I've got this brain tattoo that says, yes, yes, the Lord has given it to me. I've acquired it. He gave it to me through another man. I've, I've got it. They only come through other men and experiences. Got to have experiences. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, cliff diving necessarily or, you know, doing crazy outdoor things. It could involve that, but it's got to be some challenges. And if life doesn't hand you enough challenges, then you can go cliff diving. Uh, but real challenges, real adventure, hard work, a boy working alongside his father in the yard, maybe on the ranch, wherever you are, doing things with them, hands-on with one another. But a way to hurt a kid at this age uh, is by not providing any of that. Set them in front of a screen for hours on end or days on end, and all they get is screen time. No challenge, no uh, test, nothing. Just, just absorb whatever's coming through the screen, whatever that screen might be. And so... Uh, the other way a boy is hurt at this age is when there are challenges, but they don't end well. So you got a, you know, a uh, kid, and he's built a ramp, and he's jumped his bike off of the ramp, and now he's laying in the yard with the bike on top of him. And my response to that with our son is, that was the coolest thing I've ever seen. That, that is cool. Now, here's what you need to do. Let's, let's get up, and you okay? All right, let's go. You're not okay? I don't care. Let's go. Do that again. And you do it successfully. And so when something doesn't end well, there needs to be a man in that boy's life to put it into context. Pick him up, brush him off, and let's, let's do this thing again, okay? Because if this need is unmet, then boys become men who won't risk. They play it safe. Don't take they become soft. When it comes time in life to contend for things, which we'll talk about in a couple minutes, when it comes time to contend for things, they won't do it. They become soft. Boys need to be invited into something. They need to have something in front of them to aim for. To aim for. Um, our son's name is Mitch, and he'll be 31 in a couple weeks, and he was like seven or eight. Uh, Teen Challenge got invited to this certain event, and so we all went, and it was just Mitch and 25 of his best friends who were 18 and over. Um, and um, this guy who held this event gave, gave me a Bible. He said, here, I wanted to give this. It was a nice, le genuine leather Bible. It was all shrink-wrapped and boxed up. And you know, it was like, you know, I carried it like it was the Holy Grail, you know. And, and Mitch said to me, um, that's kind of cool. I'd like to, could I get one of those? I said, tell you, I'll give you this one. I said, when you become a man, you get this Bible. Okay, well, when's that? I'll let you know. So I put it down in our office area. I put it down on my desk. And for years, he came and looked at that thing, and when, and when his birthday came around every September, you know, now, I, not yet, finally I told him, uh, maybe I don't know what age he was, I told him, 12, when you're 12, on the trajectory you're on, when you're 12, you get that thing, okay? So his 12th birthday came, and he scrambles down there, and I'm ready for that thing, and I started to hand it over. I said, now, one thing you need to know about this, okay? This is not your um, illustrated Bible, this is not your um, living Bible, your paraphrase. Those things are uh, equal to a, a, a felt tip sword, you know, a rubber sword, or to a suction cut bow and arrow. This is a real weapon that men use. This thing cuts. This thing has some power and some authority. So this is yours. Take it and use it. And it's in his house today, and he uses it. But point is, you've got to put something in front of them to aim for. That was something he decided was of value, and he went for it. Well, around 20 years old, guys start contending. Go to that next slide. Yeah, they start to fight, not fist fight. They start to contend for some things, develop some inner conviction, some inner strength, kind of start to figure out, what do I stand for? What are the principles and the truths? What are the biblical truths that I stand for and that I don't stand for? Things that I won't uh, allow Starts to develop that strength. You see this in Jesus when he's cleansing the temple. And I love this when Jesus is cleansing the temple because up to now, he's been pretty much what we think of Jesus, meek, mild, humble, whatever. He comes in the um, um, temple, and he kind of checked all that at the door. 
He comes in, he's turning tables over, and notice what the Scripture says. It says that he made a whip. This is a premeditated act. He thought about this, and he made a whip, and he came in and took care of things. This is a warrior. This is a warrior. God says of himself, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Yeah, that's what he wants to give to men. Being a warrior is actively overcoming, actively overcoming this passivity that we inherited from Adam. But it takes active intervention. You have to be after it. This warrior heart is pushed down, kind of repressed when a boy's taught one of two things. When a boy's taught that all aggression is wrong every single time. We never uh, act out of uh, uh, aggressively. We don't do that. That's interesting because when I read the Bible, I see David, um, I wonder, how the heck did he get so good with a, a slingshot if he wasn't aggressive? Or why does he write in the Psalms, uh, you have trained my hands for battle? Sounds like an aggressive guy. Then I see him as a shepherd going out killing a lion. This is a guy with some, um, some uh, aggressive traits. The flip side is that a heart is pushed down when a boy is taught that everything is worth contending for. Everything. You just drop the gloves and go at it on everything, physically, verbally, whatever. Whether it matters or not, you go to the mat because the key is that you win, that you're right. Maybe it's an argument. The key is that you win, and you walk away the winner, and if they get left in the dust, then so be it. But you don't ever give in. That'll kill the heart of a boy. John says this, I write to you, young men, because you're strong and have overcome. He's talking to warriors. John's talking to warriors right there. Well, the next stage is kind of easy to blow by or just pretend that it doesn't exist, and that's the stage of a lover. Kind of kick-started in your uh, late teens, early 20s, usually when a girl comes across your radar. This is a stage of a heart now that's beginning to come alive. The heart's starting to come alive. And you're looking outward more than you are inward. See, David now was a mighty warrior, yes. He's also a musician, also a poet. And you read the book of Psalms, and you read some of the things that he wrote, and you go, okay, this is a guy whose heart is engaged. He's not just out killing bears and giants. Uh, He's engaged intimately with the Lord. It's a stage where a guy discovers, gosh, you know what? There's an entire world out there outside of cars and sports. There's a whole world. There's music. There's art. There's literature. There's young ladies. Here's another thing that he starts to learn at this phase, and and, uh, it's that, hey, maybe a woman doesn't want to be a project. (laughs) Maybe she doesn't want to be fixed. Maybe she just wants to be listened to. That's really going to be hard to do if you have no idea where your heart is. If your heart isn't engaged, you're not going to be very successful at listening. But a guy's heart is hurt at this uh, phase when he's rejected, and that happens when the girl breaks up with him. He needs a context with, uh, with which to process that. He needs his dad to come by and say, yep, I know that happens, that stinks. Let's go to McDonald's or whatever. You know, it's okay. There'll be, there'll be another. And he gets, again, he gets that from mom. That's awesome. And he needs that from mom. He needs it from dad if he's going to be uh, a man. If he's going to grow into being a man. It's also hurt this heart of this uh, boy at this phase when he's more creative. He's more interested in the arts. But his dad's a jock, or his dad's a gearhead, or his jag, dad's a big outdoorsman, hunter, repeller, you know, bow hunter, whatever. There's nothing wrong with any of that, but when dad is that and he makes fun of his kid or he puts him down, calls him soft, won't have anything to do with him, maybe he's not quite that uh, aggressive about it, maybe he's a little more covert about it, but basically that boy then gets that, okay, see, I knew it. Something's wrong with me because I'm not macho like dad is. That will smash the heart of a boy. Also, sexual experiences too early and outside of marriage. You violate God's word. You violate the other person. You violate yourself. And you string a whole bunch of those together, and that's going to crush your heart 
You will no longer, if you had any inkling to be the lover, to care for, for women, that'll go away real quick. That'll go flying out the window. Well, around 40, a man starts to be, become uh, entrusted with uh, power, with influence, with some calling. This is a time now more where he's leading, beginning to lead some people, giving and serving others. And a big question for a guy at this phase is, hey, what's it like for those who are under my authority, who work for me, report to me? Maybe I don't have the uh, org chart uh, authority over them, but I have influence in their lives. What's it like for those people? I think of um, a danger here, and I think of uninitiated men. It's a big danger. Men who haven't been invited into masculinity, they get money, they get power, they get influence. They got a little breathing room now financially. And they go out and they buy the ma most massive big screen you've ever seen, cartoonishly large big screen, and a recliner to match. Or I go out and I get the boat, and I've got this thing decked out with every doodad you can imagine. And all, all the things, all the toys. That's what happens oftentimes when a guy has not been invited into masculinity. Now it's about me. Now I get to do whatever the heck I want because I've acquired a little power, a little authority, and I've got a little income to back that up. But a man who's been through initiation, who's been invited into manhood, he can be trusted with authority. He can be trusted with some power, with some money, with some influence. Think of the parable of the talents. Parable of the talents. Those who get more are those who can be trusted with a little. So at this phase, put that next slide up. At this phase, uh, if a man was never loved, he'll start to misinterpret things in his 40s and 50s. He'll see it as all about him. If he's never a cowboy, if he never had adventure, if he never had testing put into context for him, he'll just seek adventure. He'll just go out and do all kinds of crazy things because he's got the money to do so. If he's never a warrior, he'll start battles that, that don't matter. He'll go to the mat over anything just to prove that he's right. Or he'll lead people into passivity. He wouldn't, as the saying goes, say poop if he had a mouthful. He'd just get along with everybody. I don't take a stand for anything. And if he's never a lover, if his heart was never engaged, he'll get a trophy wife or he'll have an affair or a series of affairs because he was never invited into masculinity, okay? That's a middle-aged crisis. It's men who should be ruling, men who should have authority, but they're using it for themselves. They're boys. They're using it for themselves, and they're doing what boys do. And a man needs someone to say, hey, here's what I see in you. Come, aside, come, come over here. I've noticed something about you, and I want to ask you if you'd like to go over here whatever over here means, into a new role or a new position or a new thing to do. Come on, I think you've got what it takes. Let's go. Take them by the hand. and That's disi Christian discipleship, right? Take somebody by the hand and walk them to Jesus. And then let them grow and develop. Guys need another man to do that. Well, that all leads to our final stage, which is the sage. And the sage starts about age 60 plus, and it's a time of fathering, providing counsel, uh, giving away wisdom that you've learned from experience, both success and failure. And the key question here uh, at this phase is, am I using, how am I stewarding what God has given? Am I using what he's given or have I hit the recliner? God's given me um, decent health. He's given me experiences. He's given me uh, business to run in the past. He's getting all these different things. So now what am I doing with it? I'm working on my drive or my putt? Or am I using it to invest in other people, giving it away? It's a time of greatest influence. I think about Paul being in uh, prison in Rome. He's not out traveling around planting churches anymore. He's writing letters. And I imagine the postmaster there in Rome is going, this dude is a prol prolific letter writer. Well, they're not just letters going out. Paul's sending out influence that we benefit from today. And so it's a time of great influence, even though you're no longer the CEO, no longer the president, no longer uh, even showing up on an org chart anywhere. You don't have the power, you don't have that authority, but you have unspoken authority. You have the authority that God has given to you. There's some weight to what you say, some 
to the experiences that you've been through, okay? Now, it's not too hard to find these days, not too hard to find people who are experts on everything. I mean, you know, get online. You find expert on everything that, that you need, and they are more than willing to have you sign up for their deal or enroll, get a subscription to their whatever it might be, join their group, whatever it might be. Here's the deal with a sage. A sage doesn't have you enroll in anything. A sage just invites you. Sage doesn't sell you anything. They just invite. Come on in. Let's walk through this together. That's what a sage does. And men, you need a man who sees something in you, whose words carry authority and they carry weight. doesn't mean you agree with everything they say. It just means that you're willing to take that and to weigh it out and to talk about it and consider it, okay? Thank God he brought those people to my life in my mid-30s when I surrendered Jesus, to, to Jesus. I started to get those people in my life who were still there, who uh, showed me. And, and, I mean, I miss those first, uh, not all that, but I miss those first bunch of years, probably up to about 35. I missed all that. And so I was a 34, 35-year-old, 8-year-old. That's probably being generous, right? <laughs> you had to live with it. But when God gives it to you, you, you can make up ground pretty quickly if you surrender to the process uh, that the Lord wants to do. And so I've got those people, but here's the deal. Some of those people who have great influence in my life are authors like John Eldridge. Some are musicians, people I don't know and I'll never know. That's good. Take that but it's got to be flesh and blood too. You've got to have a flesh and blood person sitting across the table from you who knows you and who knows the nuance of relationship with you. And so when we're together and they say to me, you all right? You seem like you're a little off today. Or what? Yeah. What's wrong with you? You know? See, John Eldridge never says that to me because I don't know John Eldridge from Adam. But a flesh and blood person can do that. So you've got to have those people in your life. And you know a great place to get that, guys? Saturday morning at the men's group. How was that, Mylon? I worked that right plug right in there for you. Yeah, seriously, here and at Pleasant Hill, you can go to both of them every Saturday morning if you want. But guys in your life who get to know you, and then they can come alongside and say, how you doing? Something I can pray for? You seem like you're bothered today. That's as complicated as it gets. That is as complicated as it needs to get. So the central truth from the book of Proverbs is he who keeps company with the wise, he'll be wise. Keep company with wise people, and you'll become wise. Well, the guys who are going to pray, I'll ask you to take your places wherever you're going to be here this morning, and then worship folks can come. I want to close with an illustration from uh, Normandy, from D-Day. June 6, 1944, um, Brigadier General Theodore Roosevelt, Jr. Yes, his father was Teddy Roosevelt, and a pretty aggressive guy, pretty masculine guy. But Roosevelt, Jr. was one of only two generals, he's a brigadier general, one of only two generals who was on the beach that day, who landed at Normandy, and he commanded this uh, Operation Neptune, which landed on Utah Beach. But because of the tidal currents, they got drifted way off course. The first 20 landing craft ended up about a mile and a quarter south of where they were supposed to be, which means they were separated from the rest of their party, and they were more open to enemy gunfire. So as they all scramble onto the beach and, and take cover and just, you know, that quickly try to figure out what are we going to do? What do we, how, how do we go? What do we do? This is what uh, Roosevelt Jr. says. He says it just this quickly, this succinctly. He says, guys, none of that matters. For us, the war starts right here. Let's go. And they get up and they start going. And that's what I would say to uh, men who find themselves, uh, and all I talked about today, maybe drifted off course. Go to that next slide for us. You find yourself, you've drifted off course somewhere, or maybe you missed, like me, you missed large chunks of that early on, just never got it. Or you got it, but you rebelled from it. Or as I said, you got it, but you kind of drifted off course. Well, guess what? You could start right from where you are right from where you are, and you can move forward. And so wherever you are, you can keep moving. Last slide. This is something to pray about. If you want to come and have one of these guys pray for you, not counsel. So one of my 
pet peeves Diane knows from our days at other churches is when you go forward for prayer, you end up getting counseled. I, I don't, there's a place for that, but no, I need prayer. I don't need, so these guys aren't here to counsel you. They're here to pray for you. First thing, admit you're unfinished and you need initiated. You need invited. And name, specifically name the stages you might have missed or got stuck in. God, I got stuck here or I never received this and I need that. And then admit that you can't do it alone and you can't. If you could have done it alone, I'll tell you what, if I could have done it alone a long time ago, I'd have done it because I knew I was lost. But you can't do it alone, okay? Just ask him for help to bring the right people into your life. 